development work for, for over a decade, largely working with young women uh, within youth settings but also with adult women as well, um, largely from BAME backgrounds. I was asked a couple of years ago to carry out a research into the experiences of Muslim women in prison. Um, it wasn't something I was expecting, it wasn't something that I intended to go into. Um, but I was really surprised as I thought, okay, I'll, I'll take this challenge on. I was really surprised at the time that when I did a, a desktop research of the information that was available around Muslim women in prison to find that actually there wasn't anything available. So there wasn't anything available, not on a, on a policy level um, or community level or even um, within providers. There just was, and, and that I found quite surprising because we, we have such an open dialogue around Muslim men in prison. Um, and that's quite accepted and, and a lot of the papers written are around that. Um, has anything changed in three, four years that I've been working within, within the criminal justice system? I've tried my level best actually to try and input into international policy making and, and raise the issue of the Muslimness of, of, of women. Um, so last year I did, a, I did a lot with David Lamy into his review on black Asian minority ethnic prisoners but looking at not just the gender penalty and I guess uh, the, the cultural penalty, but looking at the faith penalty that Muslim women in the system might incur. Um, you know, is Islamophobia is quite, quite rife within mainstream communities and at the moment the Muslim community are, are in the dock, if we're honest. Um, so it, it'd be naive for, to think that Muslim within the criminal justice system are not affected by that. Um, I've also done a lot of work recently with the Ministry of Justice looking at informing their policies of working around being women and offenders. I think sounds are coming through and I was very surprised actually that I was the first person in the country to look at this. Sounds are slowly coming through um, about Muslim women uh, in custody, their pre-custody experience and their post-custody ex experiences, um, but it's a very slow work in the making. If we look at some of the statistics around Muslim prisoners generally, um, I don't know how many of you are aware, but Muslim prisoners, we have just over 13,000 Muslim prisoners in the criminal justice system. So that makes up about 16% of the prison population. That's disproportionate to our community on the, inside, on the outside. Um, in the last decade, we've seen a 50% increase in the number of Muslim prisoners that are going into prison. So 50%, so there seems to be an acceptability of crime within the Muslim community. My specific interest is obviously Muslim women in prison, and they stand quite disproportionate as well at 6% of the female prison population. So it's, it's, not a new, it's not a low number in the context that they are, they're actually quite high. What is the hesitancy to discuss female prisoners? I think within our own community, naturally, there's more of a conversation and we're overshadowed by our male counterparts. Um, I think the larger number obviously means that, that women are just not really on the radar. Um, I think sometimes there's some aspects where you think there's a reluctancy to admit that Muslim women are capable of criminality. You know, that, that's always silenced a room when people say, what do you do when I'm the Muslim women in prison? But are there any? You know, that's, that's always, but are there any? And it, yeah. I'm probably quite guilty of it as well because I, I used to work in community development work and I didn't really give a second thought to Muslim women in prison and I don't know whether that's just because it's out of sight and out of mind and it's not something you think of, but I, I quickly realised there were and then I thought, well, the onus is on me to actually, to actually bring that to the forefront. Um, I think f Muslim offenders within that larger BAME spectrum, so within the BAME spe spectrum, what's happening is you can have traveler women within that spectrum. Um, you can have you know, a, a black African Christian woman in that spectrum. There's Muslim women in that spectrum. We've all, minorities have sort of really been lumped together. So to look at each particular area, I think mainstreamers can find that quite complex. And I think also what happens with mainstream prison providers and especially women's organizations are, a lot of the time I think they don't want to delve into the complexities that we have within our faith and culture. And over time, what's happened is faith and culture have become quite um, amalgamated with one another. And I think even as a community, sometimes we find it difficult to, to separate the two. Whatever the reason, um, I think my concern at this point is the fact that we have uh, an increasing number of Muslim women going into custody. And we, made, we had the same issue with Muslim men where we took our eye off the ball we thought it would be fine, there's only a couple of thousand uh, and we sit here today and there's 
closing in on um, just over 12,500 men in custody and as a community we're not really giving that attention and we're not really looking at some of the drivers behind that. What's causing that? You know, we can talk about deprivation, we can talk about social issues, but what about the acceptability around that? Um, the emphasis on, on Muslim women for me particularly, obviously from a, from a faith aspect, faith sort of dictates and, and deters us away from criminality. Um, and the fact that much isn't known about these women and they are disadvantaged on, on several fronts, whether that's age, whether that's race, whether that's gender, faith, um, is, is quite troubling for me. So I look at the social stigma throughout my first research that's attached to a Muslim women offender. Um, and it's quite harsh, actually, compared to male counterparts. You can even see within families where a brother and sister has been sentenced, that a, the sister will get a much harsher treatment. Um, oftentimes, families can um, ostracize women. There won't be visits at, fa at family visits within prisons. Sometimes children can be removed by women. And there's a very open um, double standard. Um, a lot of women speak about a double sentence. They say once we've completed a sentence in prison, oftentimes we can come out and we feel like we serve a second community sentence. So I'll always be that woman that went to prison um, and I'll never be able to shake that label off. Whereas for a man, it's quite acceptable. And we see in the Muslim community, men we currently reoffend. And it's quite acceptable. And I think that's something about community hypocrisy as well. It's nothing to do with faith. There's a lot around community hypocrisy there. Faith tells us that um, you, know, you, you seek your forgiveness with God and, and then you're able to move on. But culturally, that culture is so strong, we're not able to do that. Um, I think another one of the aspects there is, is a lot of the rules around this are defined by, by men within our communities. So there's quite a strong male patriarchy, whether that's within community centres, whether that's in mosques. Um, they define the rules, they define the parameters of participation for women. Um, and then my obvious concern within the mainstream is women that are going into the prison system have to contend with, with the dynamics that are facing our community at the moment, so whether that's racism, or Islamophobia, um, there's a lot for a, a that's can be quite a lonely journey for a woman in the prison system to have to go through alone and I think that just compounds these women's sense of like marginalization and isolation um, and the fact is there just really isn't much interest in, in Muslim women and, and their criminality I think one of the disturbing uh, facts that came out of my report is um, the fact that actually a lot of women who were entering the criminal justice system, there was a male hand behind their crimes. So that, that's not really a secret. I think anybody that works in prison, I can see one or two faces in here that do work in prisons, know that um, a lot of women's organizations have looked at this and when we say, when we say male hand, that can often be, um, they've had difficult experiences in their lives around domestic violence, sexual abuse, grooming, control, um, so that a male hand in that sense, but also sometimes there was the feeling that perhaps are some of these women covering for somebody? And not all these crimes are really sinister crimes, because you think of Muslim women in prison, and first you think that's not possible, and then when you know it is possible, you think, oh God, I bet she's murdered somebody. You know, it goes from one extreme to another extreme, so it goes from, from you know, and, and you think, well, no, actually, we're working with women here that could have done something as simple as breached a suspended driver's um, driving van to, you know, sort of theft or robbery or, you know, it could be anything. And yeah, some, some are in there for murder, but behind every woman, there's a story. So why is it as a community we're not looking at that story? Um, and this male hand aspect was something that we did identify, so it's very true of the Muslim community as well, where we think, okay, there's something going on here, but there's a there's a culture of non-disclosure. I've already said quite openly before, the Muslim community has perhaps problems with conversations and difficult conversations and these issues that we've mentioned around, you know, DV, mental health, whole array of things. We're not very good at having those conversations. So how could we possibly know how these women ended up there until we befriend them and we have these conversations? Um, but there's some really troubling cases that are coming onto the radar where you feel that Okay, is this possible? And I just wanted to give some examples of some cases as well where people might understand. So I think when, you, for example, I've had an elderly resident in custody. So when you have an elderly resident at the age of 65 who's, who's perhaps been convicted of um, conspiracy to, to supply Class A drugs, 
and it's part of a family crime and you think, was Andy G really trying to push class A drugs? Or is there something else going on here? You know, and then you find, well, actually the bigger crime is, actually her son's been incarcerated as well. So there's this real culture that Muslim women face, and we know this about our mothers and our grandmothers, of protection, of uh, protected members of the family, of self-sacrifice, self-sacrifice to the end, to conceal. Um, and that really made me question our morality as well. Cases become really complex in custody, and, and, and as I've said, there's, there's patterns that are showing that are quite disturbing. So I know at the moment, we, I've had a couple of clients in who are young girls, um, but young girls who are in, Muslim women who are in on shoplifting charges, which really made me think, why are these women shoplifting and what is that about? Because that, that's still categorized as quite a petty crime as well. So you think, what's happening there until you find that, well, actually that sister's got a drug habit, she's got an addiction. She's got an addiction, so she's, she's shoplifting to feed her addiction. Um, and that addiction, most times, comes from a relationship that she's had with a male member. Um, whether that's in the family or outside of the family, so you think, okay, and oftentimes, more recently I found that can lead to prostitution as well. So prostitution to feed your drug habits or shoplifting. So I think the dynamics within our communities are really changing. Silence, again, is another thing that, that really troubles me. So I have had cases, and, and I had one a while back, where um, women, again, are silenced to the extent where they just won't disclose, so unfortunately you find women being punished in the criminal justice system where there's been an honour killing in the house, but that woman's then been threatened and blackmailed to the extent where she can't disclose that male members in the family have done that. Um, so I think that there is a real conspiracy to silence women within the communities, and I think that all those difficult subjects that we don't talk about within our community and issues are now manifesting themselves in our sisters and our mothers and our daughters going to prison. And for me, that's shame and dishonor. Um, as I've said, I've tried my level best to try and raise that within the community, actually within, not from a 100% feminist perspective, but I purposely place myself in a mainstream organization that's connected to massages as well, to say, look, collectively, this is our problem. It's not my problem as a woman to look at the issue of Muslim women in prison. There's a lot of backdrop behind that that we're really not addressing. Um, of course, there's no, there's no excuse for criminality at all, but we need to, as a community, I just feel like we really need to understand the causes and the drivers and motivations for that, but also we need to seek solutions for that. So at the moment, as I've said, I find myself building a community resettlement model for Muslim women uh, in Bradford to say, okay, we need to do this as a community. We need to look at this. Um, the fact remains, and, and, it's, and, it, and it's always quite depressing that Actually, Muslim women in prison and, and a lot of our issues are, are located in the prison of, of a culture and that's quite a toxic culture. And I know within South Asian communities that can be very strong and, and actually it really interferes with our morality and our faith values. Um, I think that's where we see this practice of, of inequality, of like gender dislocation, of malpractice and, and, and misogyny if we're honest. Um, and, and I guess more importantly in the conference, in, in the context of this conference, we see that the relegation of faith values. So as a community, I do think we need, we need a real reflection of where we are. Um, and, and I did, and we have spoken about outward piety before, you know, that the outward projection of faith seems to be more acceptable to us. So showing the image that we, the, the physical image that we are Muslims, but our practices are, are not necessarily reflecting that. Um, and I think this is really testing times for us when we see such disproportionate numbers in, in, in prison. Um, and, and it's something to think about, really. Okay.